Welcome to the sixth episode of the Google Ads API Developer Series on Working with REST. I'm Laura Chevalier, and I'm a Developer Relations Engineer on the Google Ads API. In this episode, we're going to look at how you might go about using REST as a debugging tool. Through a series of demos, we'll get a better understanding of what the request and response objects look like and the data they provide to help in the debugging process. Let's start with a basic example to review the structure of a request. I won't go into detail on the structure of the request body, since we've done that in previous episodes focusing on search requests, resource-specific mutates, and Google Ads service mutates. Instead, I've gone ahead and saved my JSON request body in a file, campaignbudgets.json, which I'll pass as data in a curl request. This is a pretty basic example, creating two campaign budgets, but you can imagine constructing a request body for a specific API call you're interested in testing. For example, you might use REST to test out API calls to a new service you're integrating with, to verify certain behaviors, or to break a request down into bite-sized chunks while investigating a specific error. That said, let's construct our curl request. Almost every request to the API will be a post request. Then we need the URI for the resource we want to update, in this case. You'll see I've set some environment variables to store the API version, my customer ID, and some credentials I'll pass as request headers. If you need help constructing this URI, have a look at the Working with REST intro video, or take a look at the REST reference docs for a given resource. Now we'll pass our request headers, starting with setting the content type to JSON. We'll pass our dev token. Then the login customer ID, which is the ID of the account that manages the account I'm adding my budgets to. And finally, the access token, which I retrieved by sending my client credentials and my refresh token in a request to the OAuth2 endpoint. If you need help generating this value, check out the episode we did on authorization with REST. If you're coming from one of our client libraries, note that the client libraries are sending these values as well. It's just abstracted away by the library. The login customer ID and developer token headers map to config values in your client library's config, and the access token in the request gets generated by client libraries under the hood by using the client ID, client secret, and refresh token values that are also stored in that config. The last thing we'll pass in our request is our JSON request body. I'm also going to pass this dash i flag, which tells curl to output the response headers in addition to the body. You'll see why this is useful in a moment. Now I'll send this request. And you can see I get a few things back. First, we have our response headers. I want to call attention to the HTTP status code, 401, so we know that this is an auth error. Now if we look at the response body, we get even more information about what went wrong with this request. It says that the request had invalid auth credentials and that it expected a valid access token. Access tokens are short-lived, so my access token is likely expired. Let's send a request to the auth endpoint to get a new token. I've saved my OAuth credentials and environment variables and the curl request for this in a bash script. This makes it so I can refresh my access token just by running the script. Check out our authorization with REST video if you want a refresher on this part of the process. Okay, now I'll store this access token value in my environment variable and retry the request. And it works! Great! But what happens if the error comes from the contents of my request body rather than an auth issue? Let's see. 
If I change the second budget name to a new value, but leave the first to match one of the budgets I just created, I should get an error because duplicate campaign names aren't allowed. Because we don't allow partial failures by default, the entire request should fail, meaning even the campaign budget with a new name won't get created. Let's send the request. And we get an error. First thing I want to call out here is this new value in our response headers, the request ID. This value is really important when interacting with Google Teams, since it allows us to locate API server logs for more in-depth investigations. The request ID is available as a response header in most cases, both successful and failed API calls, with one exception being successful search stream responses. In this case, the request ID is available in the response body instead. Also, as we already saw, OAuth-related errors don't produce a request ID at all, since they're happening before the Google Ads API is requested. Now let's have a look at the response body. Instead of the results list we got back in our successful response, here we have an error object, which includes the HTTP status code, a summary of the error, the error type, and a details array containing a Google Ads failure object. Quick side note, this at type annotation is just metadata from the API describing which protobuf message type the object corresponds to. It's a reminder that the protobufs are the source of truth for the Google Ads API, and the REST interface is a transcoding from those protos into JSON. For debugging purposes, these annotations can be ignored. This Google Ads failure object contains a list of Google Ads errors and the request ID. You can see that a single Google Ads error contains specific details of what went wrong and where. In this case, there was a campaign budget error of type duplicate name, which by itself is pretty informative, but we also see the specific value that triggered the error and the location of that value. We see the precise location by going down the list of field path elements. The trigger was at index zero in the operations array in the create object in the name field. For a deep dive into error handling, check out the video we did on this topic. You can also find all these details in the REST reference documentation. If we look at the reference for the Google Ads failure type, we can see its structure and drill deeper into each subfield. We can see that the error code subfield, for instance, is an enum containing many specific error types. Each of these error types branch off into even more specific error codes to maximize the information available to you for debugging. Other than our error information, we also have the request ID in the response body. This will be included in the response body in addition to the response header for almost every error response, except when the request has set partial failure to true. That brings me to our next example. In Google Ads API request bodies, we have the option of sending some additional fields along with our operations. One of those additional fields is the partial failure field. This tells the Google Ads API to carry out any successful operations and return errors for any invalid operations. Note that this isn't available on all services, and you can verify in the REST reference documentation which methods allow this. For instance, the Google Ads service search and search stream methods don't have a partial failure field because there's no way for a search request to succeed part way. Partial failure isn't necessarily a debugging tool, but it's important to keep in mind when debugging partial failure responses that the response is structured differently from a request that has partial failure set to false, which is the default. Instead of a single error object with a details array, the response is divided into the successful results and the partial failure errors, if there are any. Let's see this in practice by setting partial failure to true in our campaign budgets example. So if we go back to our example, let's set partial failure to true. If we run this example now, where one budget name is the duplicate and the other is new, the duplicate should fail, but the budget with the new name should succeed. Let's save and run.
And now you can see the response is split into two. The results array, which has a successful result for the second campaign budget, and an empty object for the first, signaling that it was not successfully created. If we look below that, we see the partial failure error object containing an error message and a details array to look at any errors in greater detail. Like we saw earlier, each error in the errors array tells us which error occurred and where. Notice that, unlike our previous response, this response body does not contain a request ID, though you can still find it in the response header. Now let's shift our attention to another optional field in our request, validate only. Validate only allows us to validate the request without executing it, which makes it useful to test for things like missing parameters and incorrect field values. The response will contain only errors, but no results, meaning a valid request would return an empty object. As with partial failure, validate only is not available on all services. Let's see how this works with our example. Let's replace the partial failure field with validate only. Now if we run that, our response body looks similar to before. We get back an error telling us our request was invalid, and we get a request ID in the body and the header. If we fix this error, the response should instead signal that our request was valid. Let's verify that. If we give each campaign budget a unique name, the request should be valid. So let's run that. And now we get back just our response headers, including the request ID, and an empty object as our response body, meaning the request was valid. That's everything for today. I hope this was helpful to you. If you'd like to explore further, have a look at our REST documentation and the additional resources referenced in the video description. As always, we welcome your feedback and look forward to seeing you in other videos. Thanks for joining.